Hello and welcome to this lecture on Abkhazia. This lecture is designed to provide you with the background you need in order to understand the events of the early 1990s and the uh, territorial fragmentation of Georgia. It is the third lecture in a set of background lectures. So here we're going to examine uh, Abkhazia and we're going to uh, try to um, highlight certain dynamics. I'm going to discuss some of the articles that I have assigned for you. Let's first go to Google Earth and let's find Abkhazia in Google Earth. Uh, previously we were talking about North Ossetia, um, uh, Lania and then South Ossetia. So let's go to the area of Abkhazia and let's take a closer look at Abkhazia. Uh, the capital of Abkhazia is uh, Sukhumi um, it is an uh, area on the uh, Black Sea coast um, and it is uh, an area that um, was described as the Soviet Riviera, Riviera or the Soviet Florida. Uh, it is, uh, it's got a very, very nice subtropical climate um, and it mixes both the coast and beautiful mountains. So it's a very uh, uh, beautiful place um, and with a strong history of uh, tourism. So uh, the important uh, towns to remember, this is the uh, Sochi uh, in Russia, which is where the Winter Olympics are going to be held. This is the uh, Adler Sochi airport. Uh, which is about 45 minutes from Sochi and it's about uh, only half an hour, well 20 minutes from the border with uh, Abkhazia. This border is um, uh, not particularly well developed, it's not particularly smooth. It, when I was there it reminded me a little bit of the uh, US-Mexico border uh, in some ways, uh, although not nearly as smoothly developed as that. Uh, but certainly you get the sense of a very uh, affluent, relatively affluent region of Russia up against uh, what is a very poor region, um, the uh, now independent state of Abkhazia. Gagra is one of the major cities here and uh, Putsunda, which is not indicated here, uh, is another one. Uh, uh, Gadata uh, and uh, then Sukumi here. I'm also indicating the village here of Likni, which is a very significant uh, location for um, Abkhaz. And um, then other uh, towns that are significant, Ochamchira here on the coast, which is on the bo bordering the uh, Gali district. And the Gali district is an area of significant Mingrelian um, population. It was an area that uh, experienced a lot of fighting in the mid-1990s and so there's a lot of destroyed buildings. It's an area of active return. There's very few Abkhaz living in this area. Uh, this other town here, uh, going towards the mountains, uh, Charchal or Charchali uh, is a coal mining area, an iron ore area and I'll have things to say about that too. Um, this here, the Nguri River, is uh, something that uh, I've already pointed out to you and I've shown you a photograph of that significant border between uh, Zugdidi, which is the capital of Georgian Mingrelian region here, and uh, Gali, um, and that's uh, now, now an international border. Some other cities in the area, Sanaki uh, and Poti. So, uh, those are just some general um, overviews of Abkhazia and I'll talk a little bit about it in a greater detail as we get into the lecture. Okay. So the Abkhaz people um, are, they know themselves as Apsni. Uh, Apsni people, uh, the term Abkhazia is one that is a, was a name that was given to them uh, by, the, uh, by the Russians. Um, and they uh, speak a Northwest Caucasian language. It's a language 
which has some similarities to um, Circassian. Uh, it's linked to Circassian, even though it is, it's not the, the same uh, at all. Uh, the essay by George Hewitt, Abkhazia, Georgia, and uh, the uh, Circassians provide you with a lot of background on it. Uh, on the language. He himself is a linguist and so he describes the uh, Northwest Caucasian languages in great detail, describing the three different um, uh, important dialogue, dialects of the Abkhaz language. Uh, then the uh, Circassian language, which has an Eastern and uh, a Western um, a family tree, and then a third uh, language, which is extinct. Important point to remember here culturally is that the Abkhaz are part of a family of nations um, which stretch across the Caucasian mountains, um, sometimes called and misleadingly called Circassians, because Circassians are only one nation within this community of nations. Um, but sometimes the term Circassian is used to describe all of them. Um, and they have important links and ties. And these were very, very significant in the early 1990s when a lot of volunteers came from um, Cabardino, Balkaria, uh, Adige, and the North Caucasus to help the Abkhaz in their uh, struggle against the Georgians in 1992, 1993. Um, the um, Apsni people are autochronos, meaning that they're from this region, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, and their religion is not a major part of their culture. The language is really the most important thing. And then their cultural practices. Some are Muslim, uh, some are Orthodox, and the majority are Orthodox. Um, and some would be described as, as pagan. In fact, the, they have traditions which relate back to their villages and relate back to the mountains, which are uh, animist or spiritual. Uh, they are distinctively Abkhaz. Uh, and so the other religions, Orthodoxy and uh, Islam, sort of blend in with these particular practices. Uh, families are extremely important and kinship networks are extremely important in this uh, small nation. Uh, they, uh, the Abkhaz have seven different uh, locations throughout the country that are shrines or significant cultural spots for them. One of them is this uh, Linkney Square, which uh, I indicated the village to you on the Google Earth map. And this is a picture of it with some memorials from to commemorate the 1992 war, 92, 93 war. The various districts, um, there are altogether um, seven Rayoni in the district, in the area. The important uh, distinctions are the, uh, the um, Gali district, which I mentioned to you, which is right next to um, the Kador, uh, the Inger River and uh, the, um, the, uh, and Mingrelia, and then the uh, Achamchira region, the Sukum, Sukumi region, Gaudeta, Pitsunda, Gagra, up close to then the, the border with Russia. Um, like the other nations that we're examining in this um, look at the Caucasus, the uh, Abkhaz look back to uh, golden era. Uh, the Kingdom of Abkhazia, which is from 1780 to 1007, um, which marked a transition from largely Greek and Byzantine culture in the region to um, the uh, growing significance of the Georgian language and Georgian culture. Um, if you go to um, uh, our old friend Wikipedia, which is of course very uneven as a source, it does have some information which uh, can provide you with uh, some sense of the contested nature of this kingdom. Uh, but certainly it is a kingdom which extended beyond uh, contemporary Abkhazia uh, into uh, what is uh, Mingrelia and, and a contemporary Georgia proper. Um, but it is one that is uh, seen as, as, as really anchored in 
um, contemporary uh, Abkhazia centered there. So it, it's something, it's a sort of reference point. Uh, another reference point for the uh, Abkhaz is the experience uh, of conquest by the Seljuks, by David the Builder, um, uh, the creation of a, a Greater Georgia, then the Ottoman Empire ruling the area, and uh, finally the Ottoman Empire being displaced by the Russian Empire. Um, uh, the area was officially incorporated in 1810 following uh, the um, incorporation of Eastern Georgia and Mingrelia in 1806, but it was only consolidated uh, under the control of the Tsar state after 1864 uh, with the Caucasian Wars. These are very, very significant uh, events in the 19th century history of the Caucasus. Uh, the Caucasian Wars uh, were fought for um, well over 60 years. They were brought to a halt in the North Caucasus by uh, Shamil's surrender in Dagestan in 1859. Um, and uh, his, he then went into exile uh, in Russia itself, and his son actually, uh, sons actually joined the Tsarist army. So there was a sort of an assimilation and incorporation of uh, the um, the North Caucasus peoples into the Tsarist Empire. But uh, the the war continued in the. Um, more western parts and the uh, southern parts of the Caucasus uh, and the the uh, period known as the Circassian Genocide occurred in the 19th in the 19th century and occurred especially after the 18, 1859 um, now if you go to YouTube and uh, Google or uh, search under Circassian Genocide you'll find a number of videos which sort of celebrate the noble heroes fighting against the Russian uh, um, czarist uh, regime and their um, exterminist, exterminationist policies. Well, they were often exterminist, but they were also uh, um, characterized by forced migrations and uh, decisions uh, either to, the people could either be killed or leave. Um, what the Circassian genocide did, and the term Circassian is again used loosely, it's not simply just the, those that spoke Circassian, it's those that were, uh, were speaking any one of the Northwest uh, Caucasus languages. But what this led to was a tremendous outmigration of peoples in the wake of this uh, conquest by the Tsarist state. Uh, across the Middle East, from Kosovo all the way to Syria, uh, Palestine, and Jordan, um, into the Balkan uh, Peninsula. So you have the ancestors uh, of um, Circassians, of uh, Abkhaz in uh, this region, particularly in Turkey. Um, and the migration to Turkey has its own name, and the diaspora that is there that still looks to and speak looks to Abkhazia and speaks Abkhaz um, has the name uh, Muhajar, and um, the term ni means he who has left. Now. Um, there was large-scale in-migration in the wake of these deportations from Georgia, um, from Russia, uh, from Ukraine, uh, and others. There were uh, residual revolts after this particular period because not a, not all the Abkhaz were were cleared out, but but quite a number were. 1866 and 1877. This is significant because. Of course, the great hero, the great protector of the Abkhaz people today is, is Russia. And so the Georgian state, when it wants to make mischief and to try to create a wedge between the Abkhaz and the Russians, will mention the Circassian genocide. And uh, I know that this, the Georgian state has plans to commemorate this Circassian genocide 
uh, and um, of course this is seen as in some sense it's a provocation um, but it, it was it's a very it's a real historical event and it is one that uh, was extremely searing to the Abkhaz who um, like any of these small uh, Caucasian peoples have a very strong sense uh, of the fact that they could be eliminated so they have a strong sense of their the, their need to be very aggressive in protecting their position within the Caucasus. Now the period um, of the um, early 20th century from 1905 to 1920 or so was of course characterized by tremendous revolutionary upheavals like we saw in the previous lecture. This is a sort of moment where the center fails and where you have the development of all sorts of uh, independent uh, states and polities and uh, aspirations on the parts of the various peoples in the Caucasus. In Georgia, like we saw, you had the establishment of an independent Menshevik-controlled state, Noe Jordania, uh, control, uh, being the head of that state. Uh, you had, uh, amongst the um, Northwest Caucasian-speaking peoples, the establishment of the Circassian Mountain Republic. Um, and then you had a, the White Army in this area too, and the Red Army. The Red Army eventually winning, and um, it coming to power, and um, certain Abkhaz Bolsheviks helping it coming to, to power. The, the leader of the Abkhaz uh, Bolsheviks was a, a, a young um, leader by the name of Nestor Lakoba. And what you had established initially by the Red Army in this area was an Abkhaz uh, Union Republic. It's very significant uh, this particular moment and it's important to sort of grasp that the history and the chronology here. So the 4th of March 1921 Soviet power was declared in Abkhazia and uh, by the end of that month Abkhazia was declared as an in it declared itself independent of Georgia. It becomes a union republic equal in status to, to Georgia. And of course, Georgia would later be conquered by the Red Army. Um, and in uh, February of the next year, Abkhazia was joined with Georgia as a federal republic on the basis of a special union treaty. Well, this was somewhat vague, but essentially it meant that Abkhazia was independent of Georgia, but it had a sort of special relationship with it. So it was sort of a, a confederation where Abkhazia and Georgia had uh, were nominally had the same status but Abkhazia was really uh, looking towards Georgia and, uh, and it was a way of dealing with the uh, contested sovereignty um, because the Abkhaz wanted their own uh, particular state their own uh, they wanted to be the separate unit within the uh, emerging Soviet Union at this time what is significant is that uh, that sort of slight diminution in the status of Abkhazia then um, is deepened in the early 1930s. In February 1931, uh, Abkhazia becomes an autonomous republic within Georgia. And this is a significant diminution of its status. So rather than being uh, on a status somewhat similar to and equal to Georgia, it becomes a unit within Georgia. Uh, now, it is an autonomous republic. It's not like a South Ossetia, which was just an autonomous oblast. But it, it was a, a, a moment where the aspirations of the Abkhaz were, um, were dented. Um, and so this is the it as a union treaty republic. Now, it's important to remember Abkhaz to, to this day uh, recall Abkhazia as a separate union republic. So they have a memory of it as effectively an independent state, uh, separate from Georgia. And so they would go back to that and, and see that as a significant moment, even though it was not uh, that long in, in historical terms. Now, uh, during this time, we had the, the rise of Stalin. And the marginalization of Trotsky. And there's an interesting story actually about the ways in which uh, Stalin 
uh, gain power. Uh, one of Stalin's rivals for a uh, domination was, of course, Leon Trotsky. And um, Leon Trotsky and his wife were uh, in Sukhumi in 1924 when Lenin died. So he was uh, recuperating. He wasn't feeling particularly well. And he was staying in Sukhumi. And Stalin, um, together with his uh, agents in uh, Sukhumi, managed to make it very difficult for Trotsky to get back to Moscow um, for the burial of Lenin. And effectively, in preventing Trotsky from getting back, uh, it meant that uh, Stalin had... Uh, the privileged place at the death of Lenin and was in, in, the best, in, in the best position to then take over as Lenin's successor. And of course he marginalized uh, Trotsky and sent him into exile, fled into exile, and of course then Stalin's agents finally killed Trotsky in Mexico. Now this is the Hotel Ritza, which is at the center of Sukumi. It has been restored um, after it being completely destroyed during the um, the fighting of 1992-1993, um, on the third, the second floor balcony, so the third floor, um, is where Trotsky gave a speech uh, on the death of um, uh, Lenin uh, to the assembled crowd below, and um, that room is still. Um, known as Trotsky's room uh, and you can stay there for just a little bit more in terms of price than the other uh, the other rooms uh, I was in the room next to uh, to this room uh, when I was staying there um, now this particular hotel was originally built in Tsarist times uh, and it you can just see how, how beautiful it was and it's directly facing the uh, Black Sea coast and it, this was an area that was already developed as a tourist spot during ASR's times. So um, now to kind of get some sense of the uh, what was going on in this particular time, uh, a really excellent article is a Timothy Blauvelt's article, Abkhazia, Patronage and Power in the Stalinist Era. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is uh, I, I'm just going to briefly summarize some of the points that, that he makes in this excellent article uh, about the uh, place of, uh, of um, Abkhazia. Um, he first points to the importance of circular flows of power and patronage. And Abkhazia, because it was a holiday resort, for the Soviet elite sort of short-circuited some of the official um, structures and hierarchies of power. The hierarchy should have been the, the federal center of the Kremlin and then the Union Republic and Tbilisi uh, and then only um, the autonomous uh, Republic uh, um, of Abkhazia. But because Stalin was in a, um, a, in Abkhazia uh, a lot, uh, Lakoba was able to have a personal relationship with them and he was able to get favors and so there was a sort of patronage system uh, which operated which was outside of and uh, separate from the official lines of reporting and hierarchy administrative structures of the Soviet Union I think that's a very very important point so here um, you can uh, see some of the uh, Whoops. Um, this here is some of the buildings. This is what uh, the uh, region looks like. So this is from Pitsunda, and you can see the beautiful uh, Black Sea, very nice beaches here, actually nicer than in Sochi, and then the uh, mountains uh, in the distance. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the many hotels which was built for the uh, 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution in 1967. There's about uh, seven of those along the hotel. They're uh, along the coastline um, at Pitsunda. They're all all deserted uh, now. Uh, interestingly, and above here, this red building is a uh, the uh, dacha of uh, Stalin on Lake Ritsa. 
in um, Abkhazia. He had a number of dachas, uh, uh, summer homes in this area. Um, in the 1920s and the 1930s, the uh, key power in Abkhazia at the local level, uh, level was uh, Lakoba. And it was, he was so powerful it was known as Lakoba Stan. Um, he used the effort by the uh, Soviet authorities to uh, um, indigenize uh, the parties, uh, this particular effort of uh, indigenization, uh, Karin Zat uh, Ziaya, uh, led to the increasing cadres and rise in the number of uh, Abkhaz. Uh, who were uh, in the Communist Party. There were also significant investments in infrastructure and coal and in electric power, uh, hydroelectric power in, in this period. And there was also significant resistance to collectivization. Uh, now, there were um, a lot of power struggles between uh, Lakoba uh, and uh, those who were based in Tbilisi or those who were rivals to him, particularly uh, Beria who became uh, head of the, uh, the secret police under or Stalin. Um, so there was a checking campaign, which then was essentially, uh, it, officially it was to, to check on whether uh, the five-year plan had been um, uh, adopted and implemented in an efficient way, whether a particular party officers were, were doing what they said they were doing. But it was uh, a sort of... A, a rationale and an excuse for purges, uh, which were very characteristic of Stalin's rule during the uh, during the 1930s, and of course that uh, subsequently became the Great Terror. Um, you had the uh, um, Lakoba's power increasingly being checked by the rise uh, of Beria, and then you had the Gadata. Uh, incident of February 1931 and so let's just uh, look a little bit in greater detail at that and um, what this article says about this period because I think it's uh, really quite quite interesting so uh, the this pertaining uh, Gaudata incident for February 1931 originally was uh, a large crowd of pe peasants which began to gather in Lakoba's hometown, and it happened to be the hometown of Linkney, uh, it's a very significant uh, location for uh, the Abkhaz. And they began to protest against uh, a collective, collective, the establishment of collective farms. Uh, they protested against the division of peasants into class categories, as well as against government anti-literacy campaigns, but apparently because it forced women to attend evening classes away from their families and children. So uh, this then becomes a, a protest uh, and uh, the uh, protest only dissipates when Lakoba turns up himself. He addresses the assembled peasants and he promises to intercede on their behalf. Um, and as often happened in this particular period, the center, uh, central authorities allowed time for passions to settle. And then several weeks later, the leaders of the demonstrators were rounded up in a single night and charged with unrelated crimes. Uh, now, at this moment, uh, the, it was uh, this actual month that you had the uh, demotion of status of Abkhazia. And it has been argued by Abkhazian historians, this is the section I've highlighted, that the price... Lakoba paid for his leniency in collectivization was his acquisition to uh, acquiescence to the reduction in status of Abkhazia to an autonomous republic within Georgia. And then uh, the, the author adds that there is no documentary evidence for this claim, but the timing is striking as the status decision was finalized at the same time. Uh, now, um, the great rival to um, Nestor Lakoba was uh, Lavrenti Beria. Um, you can read a lot about him, a very nasty individual indeed. Um, he was Mingrelian. He was born uh, outside of um, the um, of Sukumi. So he was um, essentially born within uh, an environment 
uh, which was uh, predominantly Abkhaz, uh, and he grew up in a Georgian uh, Orthodox uh, family. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, what he did. Well, um, one of the things that it is alleged that he did is that he murdered uh, Lakoba. And there seems to be really quite a, a lot of uh, significant evidence for this. Uh, I will leave it to you to read the section uh, in the article by uh, Blauvelt uh, on this. I think it's really kind of very interesting. Uh, let me just uh, direct your attention to this photograph which features um, Beria in the center and Nestor uh, Lakoba on his left and this is taken in Moscow in 1935 so after that uh, Gaudetta incident and just before um, uh, Lakoba was murdered and it was very very common for a lot of uh, leaders to be murdered people associated with Stalin to be murdered at this time what this did, the fall of Lakoba, led to the uh, rise of um, Beria in uh, Abkhazia and in Georgia real large. And from 1937 to 19, 1953, the pendulum swung in terms of power in Abkhazia. Uh, and you had the uh, large-scale resettlement of Georgians in this area. And you had a, a a, a policy of changing and transliterating pl place names. So Sukum was renamed Sukumi in 1936, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Gal District, Gali becomes Gali District. And significantly, you also had the Georgification of the language. Uh, you had the um, um, move from Cyrillic um, to the, uh, in some instances, they had used the uh, move to Latin. You, that was replaced then with a Georgian language, a uh, Georgian script. The Abkhaz schools were shut down, uh, and uh, that then lead to, led to great resentment on the part of the Abkhaz. Now, Stalin uh, is certainly someone who um, was very acutely aware of the power that he gave his subordinates and how he built up their power and then began often became paranoid about that power and so then he began to build up other subordinates in order to check the power of the initial subordinates that he had uh, empowered so he did that in the case of a uh, the Abkhazia so the first secretary of the Abkhaz Communist Party was effectively Stalin's a uh, man and um, you had the uh, rivalry between this first secretary and a uh, barrier for control in in Abkhazia. The significant uh, thing to point out here is the demographic transition, uh, transformation that is occurring. Now, this already had begun in the 19th century when you had the uh, great exile, the Circassian genocide. So a lot of Abkhaz were driven out and, and went to Turkey. Um, but if you look in 1897, approximate figures, the Abkhaz were still nevertheless the majority population in the area. Russians, very, very small amount. By 1926, already uh, Kartavelians, which is a kind of catch all category for Georgians, most of those would be Mingrelian uh, speaking Georgians, um, um, dumb, you know, the pop, more populous than the uh, Abkhazians. Uh, and then in 1939, just look at that figure, 91,000 Kartavelians uh, versus 56,000 uh, Abkhaz and uh, 60,000 Russians. So the, the Abkhaz are really marginalized uh, relative to the uh, Georgians and the Russians in this area. And then it continues uh, in, with these particular figures. Well, part of that was the actual colonization of the area and there was a deliberate policy of, migra of giving migrants land and uh, houses, uh, almost Sears, Roebuck type kit houses. This is one 
a type of house which was a create one of those kind of kit houses for Georgian settlers in this area, um, and so this would have dated from the uh, the nineteen thirties, uh, and as you can see, it's not particularly large, but it is uh, it marks this policy of of the colonization of the the territory by by Georgians, mostly Mingrelians. And you had this change uh, in the script that I, I, I believe I mentioned, uh, changing initially the Abkhaz language was uh, uh, rendered in Cyrillic in 1900 by um, uh, some Russian linguists, um, changes to Latin in 1926. And uh, after the fall of Lakoba uh, and the rise of Beria, the, the two to uh, absolute power, uh, the um, imposition of the Georgian script. This also happened in South Ossetia uh, as well, before um, then the fall of Stalin and Beria in, in 1953 and, and the change back in 19, which was made possible in 1954. The period from the 1920s onwards uh, with the five-year plans and the uh, collectivization and the tremendous investment transformed the, the area. Uh, there was large-scale industrialization, but most of the people that were in the, working in these factories were not Abkhaz. They were Russians and they were Georgian Mingrelians. So this is a Charchel, a Charcheli a coal station. Uh, this is, was taken um, last November, so November 2009. Uh, all of this is sort of an industrial ruin by and large. There's still one uh, area uh, that is working in this, in this whole industrial uh, complex, which is um, uh, next to the mountains. Um, so one of the things that's quite interesting is the uh, ways in which the Soviet nationality policy and Abkhazian nationalist mobilization cha transformed over this particular period. Uh, you had uh, the Mingrelian affair of 1951, which clipped the wings of Beria and purged his network in Georgia. You had 19, the kind of the central significance of 1953, Stalin's death and, and Beria's uh, initial revenge against Stalin's network uh, and those who had opposed uh, Beria in Georgia before then um, uh, Beria himself was, was isolated and uh, executed by the, um, the other communists, uh, by the Politburo, uh, um, headed by Khrushchev. Um, in, in, 19, in December of 1953. Uh, and then from 1954 onwards, a slow move towards destalinization, a rolling back of these Georgification policies that had been uh, pursued by Beria. Um, and slowly the Abkhazian cadre were able to reassert their claims to power within the party. And um, whereas previously they were uh, expelled from the party, now they, there was an emphasis on bringing them back into the party. But in this period uh, the, of the turning of the wheel and the turning back to um, openness towards the Abkhaz themselves, um, there were a lot of Abkhaz resentments which had to be managed by the Soviet state. From the late 50s, however, until the 1970s, Abkhazia was one of the few non-Russian administrative units in the Soviet Union where the first and second party secretaries were from the native population. So um, nominally they had uh, people who shared their uh, nationality, their ethnicity in positions of power. But um, the legacy of the previous say, 25 years were quite significant. Most of the Abkhaz were poor, they were in agriculture, they were peasants, they weren't uh, industrial workers, there were, there were some. Uh, most of the Abkhaz had limited educational opportunities, they had no university until to 1997, there was limited investment in the area and uh, there were problems with environmental despoilation of the area by, uh, um, by groups that were uh, considered to be Georgian. So I'm... Um, I have assigned this particular essay, uh, which is very interesting, uh, by Daryl Slider, 
and um, it is from Central Asian Survey from 1985, from before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so he goes into detail uh, into some of the resentments or concerns of the uh, local Abkhaz population um, and um, documents these, which then were grounds for um, the events of 1978. Where, where you had a sort of explosion or at least a series of events which uh, led to um, rising ethnic tensions in the area. So there were petition signings against the changing of the constitution um, and um, there were defacing of Georgian signs by the Abkhaz. There were demonstrations in Sukhumi and our old uh, well-known location in Likni village again um, up to 20,000 people. Now these were illegal events in the Soviet Union so they were really kind of pushing the envelope here in terms of what was possible. But uh, they got the attention of the Politburo, they got the attention of the center and the uh, local Abkhaz first secretary was replaced by another Abkhaz um, and a series of changes were gradually introduced. But interestingly, in the sending a delegation to try to solve some of these uh, um, resentments and uh, protests by the Abkhaz, the, um, the delegation from the Central Committee rejected certain uh, policies. So, page 61 of Slider's article, um, Kapintonov rejected, and this is the head of the Central Committee delegation that studied the complaints of the APCAS concerning the language and culture. So they rejected two concrete proposals that were apparently advanced by a number of APCAS party members. One would have added a provision to the Constitution giving Abkhazia the right to secede from Georgia and attach itself to the Russian Republic. This, he argued, would not conform to the Soviet Constitution. Another proposal would have eliminated Georgian as the uh, official language in Abkhazia. This was rejected as contradicting Le Lenin's policies. Um, now, I highlight that in order to underscore the fact that there were aspirations consistently on the part of the Abkhaz to be separate from Georgia, and there were tremendous tensions um, surrounding the uh, the whole status of the of education, uh, of the language, uh, and of history in the area. Well, the policy changes that were adopted in the wake of the events of 1978 um, were the Sukumi Pedagogical Institute was greatly expanded, and the Abkhaz State University became Abkhaz State University in 1979. It had classes in Russian, Abkhaz, and Georgian. Um, so it was a multi-ethnic university, but it was expanded in a way which privileged the, the Abkhaz language in a in way no institution had previously. There also began broadcasts in the Abkhaz language for the first time, broadcast on television. Uh, a separate theater, a separate dance uh, troupe was established for the Abkhaz. There was an attempt to revise history books, history textbooks to have a less overtly Georgian version uh, of history and then there was new economic investment in the area some factories and an infrastructure development ring roads and new airport uh, these things were, were were very significant in helping um, make uh, re uh, diffuse some of the uh, resentments on the part of the Abkhaz but it's significant that a uh, slider concludes writing in 1985 remember the reactions of, by many Georgians, this is page 65, uh, both within and outside Abkhazia, is that these measures are worse than unjustified concessions. Many are perceived as discriminatory. Indeed, there have been allegations by Georgians that policy changes in Abkhazia have gone much beyond those outlined in public resolutions. Uh, Georgians are now prevented from moving to Abkhazia by a new rule uh, which prohibits the registration of internal passports there. It's also been said that Georgians are not allowed to build new homes, at least in certain districts in Abkhazia, uh, thus preventing grown children from starting their own households. The demographic issue was very, very sensitive and the tilt by the Soviet state towards the Abkhaz in this period was deeply resented 
by a lot of the Georgian Mingrelian population. That's the context within which uh, one has the uh, development in 1985 of Glasnost and Perestroika. And that's and what that led to in Abkhazia and in Georgia uh, writ large is what we now turn to. Okay, I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, and let me just leave you with a table of the demographic situation from uh, George Hewitt's article in which you can see the figures for Georgia as a whole uh, and then the figures uh, in terms of the population of Abkhaz. I, I leave with this because I want to underscore the fact that throughout this lecture I've been talking about the Abkhazians and the uh, Georgians slash Mingrelians. Um, and I have not been talking about the fact that there are also Armenians, Russians, Greeks, Ukrainians. As you can see, the Armenians were 15% of the population uh, in 1989. Uh, as you can see, the Abkhaz, only 17.8% of the population in 1989, relative to the Georgians who weren't a, uh, weren't a, a numerical um, majority, but were a plurality, 45 0.7% of the population of the, um, the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic of Abkhazia. Those are important sort of baseline figures um, because one of the things that we will find out about Abkhazia is that this particular figure uh, of 525,000, um, that was a peak figure. Today, the population of Abkhazia is at most 220,000. So over half the population were driven out as a consequence of these wars. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let's move on to the next lecture.